Hi everyone, this is uh, Howard. Welcome to STR webinar. I'm going to start off with some cases with this patient. I'm going to show you a couple of radiographs and you'll see in a moment how that plays in. But take a look at this one. This one is from October 2017. I'm not going to give you any information at the moment. I'll put alongside it a radiograph from February of 2018, which is this one. And try to make that one come back. There it is. And take a look at that. And if you see any interesting finding, then I'll go and put on one from October of 2018 in the place of this one, which is that one. And see if you see anything that is present interestingly present on all three images. She's, she's right. got a lot going on, it looks like. A lot of potential things. Is, that, is her esophagus dilated, just ah. like a presby esophagus? Yeah, very good. And yeah. then there's some, that left hilum, just lateral to it, it looks a little, yep, yeah, there's like a tubular thing there. I don't think that's going to pan okay. up anything particularly abnormal. But the esophagus, interestingly, is dilated with air, certainly here, on all three exams. So when she came to us, initially we didn't have all that, all the information, but I'll show you this. And I'm going to scroll fast just to first show you the lungs. And I don't have proof as to what's happening in the lungs. But they're not entirely normal. There's bronchial wall thickening. It seems like the right lower lung is more expanded. But I will tell you that we do have a history of a right upper lobectomy. So we just have two lobes on the right side because of that. And we did then also get a history that in childhood, she apparently was diagnosed with a tracheal bronchus and something else. Hmm. And I don't know what a clinical presentation was in childhood, but they did perform a right upper lobectomy. So here's the really interesting astute observation that was made on the CT, which is right there. Right there. And we sure have a communication, a fistula, between the trachea and esophagus. And that's undoubtedly why the esophagus is distended with air. So this is not a young person, but here is some context. So she's 38 now. She's got the history that you see there. She's had a lifetime of symptoms. And sure enough, she was discovered to have a tracheoesophageal fistula. Bronchoscopy confirmed that. Mm. We have some images from bronchoscopy that showed the fistula. And as you can see there, they went in and repaired that fistula. So that's really interesting. I'm not quite sure what she had in childhood. Maybe she's had that forever, but she's now 38 and has lived with this TE fistula for all these years and hmm. never apparently suspected of having it on, on any particular basis. So undoubtedly part of a congenital condition, I would think, but really interesting. And I'm not sure if I remember seeing an unsuspected T fistula presenting in this way in an adult, having lived all these years with the T. Howard, in a sense that the tracheal dilation regressed after the um, fistula was closed? After the fistula was closed. Um, I don't know if I've seen post-operative radiographs. So I don't know the answer to that. Are you thinking of a certain mechanism, David? Well, I'm just wondering whether um, the esophagus is being distended with air because of this active fistula or whether there's actually a muscle problem with the esophagus and it remains abnormal even after they close the fistula. Okay, That's, so you could have both. You could have you know, a, how much motility she has and things yeah. like that. I'd have to look back to see if they've ever evaluated her esophageal motility with the contrast exam or some other means. I don't know the answer to that. Yeah, that, that's, that's a, a good point. I think we see patients that have had a TE fistula repair that end up with abnormally distended esophag esophagus and dysmotility. 
so that the esophageal disorder is part of the, the congenital T fistula that neonates get and so on. Huh. I'll have to look, I'm not sure. I don't know why her lungs look that way, this way. Maybe they're not that abnormal as, as abnormal as I think they might be. Maybe the right lung just looks the way it does because one lobe is gone. And I don't know if there is some mild bronchial wall disease or other from repeated episodes of aspiration, perhaps, but the lungs don't yeah. look bad otherwise. Like, I'll, bet you, I'll bet you there's aspiration here. I mean, it's so, a um, good aspiration distribution, particularly on the left. Yeah, but relatively modest findings, so. huh? Mm -hmm. Interesting. Interesting okay. case. Yeah. I thought it was going to be echolasia. Yeah, no. But maybe it's both. Both esophageal motility disorder and a T fistula she's lived with. All right, here's an interesting patient that I don't have a chest radiograph, and I'm not sure how all of this evolved. So perhaps the, the MR was obtained first, or maybe a cardiac ultrasound. Um, I do know that, as you can see from the radiograph, that the patient does have arrhythmias and obviously has an ICD pacemaker device in place. And I will show you that we have an abnormality that is related to the heart. And that's one image, but it's here. Here is a, uh, so feel free, Travis, to make any comments about the MRI. But here is a cardiac mass. It's associated with left ventricular wall. And here are some, bring that up there. So post vibe. Here is this thing, rather impressive in size. Let me bring alongside the pet. So this pet was done two days later. And we'll see that there is an area of non-FDG avid myocardium that corresponds to the region of this mass. So there it is. It certainly seems to be arising most likely from the wall of the ventricle in that location. And interesting, you can see here that this was biopsied percutaneously. So there's the needle coming in and they just put it into this part of the cardiac mass and did the biopsy. And here you can wow. see, interestingly, the core needle biopsy of that yields findings consistent with a capillary hemangioma. That's interesting, isn't it? Yeah, I wish Seth were here to comment on that because it's a rare tumor that I don't have a lot of experience with. I'm sure he's seen them at AFIP in yeah. particular. I think he or someone may have shown us a case of a capillary hemangioma. I think it was Seth maybe some years back or months back, I think. I think this is the first one I've seen that is a pathologic diagnosis of capillary hemangioma. I don't know what has happened to him. I think they talked about, well, maybe he needs a cardiac transplantation because how do you take this thing out? But I think he's been lost to follow up because when I looked for follow up, I didn't, I couldn't find any. So I don't know what's happened subsequent to the diagnosis. But it does talk about the possibility of blaming the arrhythmia on it. And there you go, capillary hemangioma of heart. Not the top of the list of cardiac masses, huh? <laughs> no. Okay. This one we've all seen, but it's such a nice case, a nice example of it, a nice teaching example of it. I'll show it to you. So the comparison from about a year before shows that these opacities in the lungs are not present previously. They are new. The clinical context is very relevant. This is, the context is kidney and pancreas transplantation. And we are a little ways out from the solid organ transplantation. And I was pretty confident in diagnosing this with this appearance as consistent with opportunistic pneumonia, particularly pneumocystis. Very typical findings, bilateral, diffuse, consolidative opacities, no findings to suggest, for example, that this is hypovolemic lung edema. I was quite satisfied that that was a primary consideration. I don't think they needed the CT because 
they were going to do a BAL, I thought, anyway. But again, the findings here are pretty consistent, pretty typical, really, of pneumocystis, and that's what it is. And they discovered that by virtue of a positive PCR on the BAL, as you can see there. But do any of you feel like I do that when you have such a typical appearance and you have the clinical context that you don't need a CT to evaluate this further? Pneumocystis is really high in the differential. You need to do a BAL, presumably, forego the CT because it's typical, I think. All right, next one is this one. Um, this one is a, just an interesting example of, first of all, two primary tumors, as it turns out, the larger one in the apical left lung, the smaller one relatively in the right upper lobe. And it's a really nice example of the pathological calcifications. These are quite large. That one can sometimes be an adenocarcinoma. So it's a large mass, it's a large tumor, but these rather amorphous, somewhat flocculent calcifications, clearly not benign, in adenocarcinoma. So one can see that in primary adenocarcinoma. One can see that with metastatic carcinomas, particularly mucinous carcinomas. This one, unfortunately, is metastatic already. It's growing through the chest wall here. We presume this one is another synchronous tumor, but a particularly nice example of calcifications in an adenocarcinoma, as you see there. Also some the process, maybe. Do we know that the right, the lesion on the right is also an adenocarcinoma? We I mean, don't. It's it wasn't, it wasn't by the tumor. She does have metastatic disease and she's been treated. So I think recently they decided that it wouldn't affect management. Um, it's pretty suspicious. Mm -hmm. Let's have a look and see what it looks like on the CT, but it's another large mass with lobulated, speculated margins, just very, and, and retraction on the pleural surfaces and so on. Very consistent with the synchronous tumor, I think. Perhaps some of this is mucin production, I'm not sure. All right, this one is kind of interesting. Um, as best I can tell, this patient came to our hospital after he was imaged at an outside institution in the context of trauma. And this is an abdominal CT, not a chest CT. So I don't think that the chest was, was the site of trauma, but this is an incidental finding. So right down here, let me just make this one up. And it's got some very typical features of an extra pleural lesion. So one can see that the opacity, the same attenuation really as muscle, is located in the extra pleural soft tissues. One can see the displaced pleura and a little bit of fat and that obtuse angle on that aspect of it. It extends right there. So a focal extra pleural incidentally discovered, as best I can tell, soft tissue mass in that location. So it's a good location for something arising from, for example, an intercostal nerve or some other mesoderm in that location. And this one was taken out and it is indeed a nerve sheath, benign nerve sheath tumor. Operative findings, a lesion involving the left ninth intercostal nerve and pathologic findings as well as immunohistochemistry consistent with that. Spindle cells is 100 positive. Just a nice example of a tumor arising from a nerve. Down there. All right, those are mine for this week. Travis, would you like to go next? Let's see who else sure. is that all right? I'll switch over to you. Maybe it may just be you and me. Okay. Yeah, there we go. Okay, I'm going to start with this one. This is a consult, and I'm curious what you guys think. This is a young woman. She's in her 30s. You can see she has had multiple radiographs. This is 2017, and this goes back as far as 2015, where they reported multiple recurrent 
pneumonias in the left lung. There's a, I think, a subtle abnormality right here, and you know, it's kind of over the spine. You'll see on the CT that they subsequently get that there's definitely something there, but I think it was there even back in 2017. And now you can see there's a little bit more vague opacity that extends mm. outward peripherally in the left lung. And still in this area, posteriorly, you can see on the lateral view. So this is an outside CT and you know, she's been referred to our pulmonologist here. And it's a very odd look. This was from two weeks ago. And you can see there's this consolidation. There's a little bit of, you know, some scar or just abnormal underlying lung here. <clears throat> and you know, my first thought when I saw this, as I was looking at the aorta, I don't see a feeding vessel, but this kind of, to me, looks like, it, or feels like it's a, a, like a, a sequestration or something congenital that perhaps that she had a feeding vessel like right here that thrombosed. And I just get, she doesn't have any obstructing endobronchial lesions anywhere. Her airways look, you know, they look relatively normal in terms of having a superior segmental bronchus and then four, you know, where she has multiple like normal seg uh, basal or segmental bronchi. But I'm just curious what you guys think because it just, just seems like it's going to be some sort of congenital thing. And I just wonder if it could have been a thrombose sequestration because I know we've seen those before. Yeah, that's a really good thought. That it's a sequestration. But I don't know, David, if you have any comments. Um, I don't think I've ever seen a thrombose sequestration, but it so sounds like a great concept. I I showed one. I'll actually I can pull it up here in a moment. It's an old case. It was actually an extra low bar sequestration. And I, when I was at Emory, I'll pull it up when I'm done showing these other cases. But it's just this lung just looks. Yeah. You know, there may be a little bit of. Could it be focal regional hyperinflation suggesting there's some bronchiolitis obliterans which. Yeah, or even, yeah, yeah, like even some sort of like CPAM or some sort of hybrid lesion that we right. occasionally see. Yeah, yeah, but she's been she's being referred to a surgeon, which I think is appropriate, especially because she's had multiple bouts of pneumonia in this left lower lobe, and there's no other, there's no carcinoid or any other underlying anatomic explanation for it. But Joe Travis, I was a little yeah. concerned about her mediastinum, which was kind of wide, and she does have a lot of thymic tissue. Um, for a 38-year-old. That is true, yeah. The first chest radiograph really showed a lot of plumpness of the upper mediastinum. Yeah, long, yeah, and I, I don't know if some of this is, uh, is rotation, as you would say. But I guess she does have a lot of thymic. Well, this is, this is the brachiostalic vein right here, and then the thymic tissue, I think, is anterior to that. Like, some of this is vein. Okay. She's got a big, you know, big subclavian and internal jugular vein right there. And I think there, you know, you can see the posterior junction line looks a little deviated to the left, like her, her mediastinum is rotated just a little, maybe because of some volume loss in this left lower lobe. I guess the fissure looks like it's pulled back just a little as well, relative mm -hmm. to the right. Do you think that accounts for it, David? I think you've, <clears throat> you've probably explained it. Yep. Um, it does seem like a lot of thymus, though, even. <clears throat> yeah, well. Does she have some, just as an aside, does she have some regional lymph node enlargement within the lobe itself? I, I think so, probably, yeah. Probably can blame yeah. that on maybe repeated infections. And, yeah, so yeah, I'm going to keep this one on my follow-up list, but I just was wondering if anyone else had a had an idea no, other like than that. But I like that a lot. Some, something congenital, you know, obviously when we have when we have young patients with recurrent pneumonias, so, okay. Well, I will keep that one on the list. This is one I'll let you look at the radiograph for a moment. I think that you know, there is a finding on the PA view. I actually think that the lateral view may be easier to see you know, the finding. I think both of them you can kind of see here. Yes. The left hilum looks a little plump. And when we, you know, the aortic arch is here and you can see it's more discrete round thing along the left PA as it would sweep down here. And so this is a lady with limited scleroderma. She had cough, which is why, what prompted the CT. And this was not exactly what I was expecting to find on the CT, but she has this large mass in her left hilum. And what's interesting is the involvement of the vessels. And, and when I saw this last month, because you see you know, 
maybe that's a little bit of bland thrombus, but it looks like it's either invading or arising from the vessels. And it was when I saw this part here where it looks like it's just kind of growing along the inside of the left pulmonary artery. Mm. And I think if I do a coronal, and we had no tissue at this point, but I thought that I felt like this was kind of growing along the inside. And so I, I thought this was probably going to be a primary intimal sarcoma, maybe lymphoma, less like or, or some weird presentation of small cell or other thing. But I thought it was more likely to be centered in the vessel rather than a primary lung cancer. And it's narrowing and, uh, that left lower low on the coronal. It's narrowing yeah. lumen. Yeah. But it's kind of all of that. It's all yeah. around. Mm. Yeah, so they actually, they did a transbronchial biopsy of this, and the, that biopsy was smooth muscle, and they thought it was going to be an intimal sarcoma, and they just did a, a pneumonectomy, and it was, in fact, an intimal wow. sarcoma. So, I don't know. Usually, I don't, usually we don't see these de novo. They all go to UCSD, but this lady presented to us, so that's what this was. Of course, with this degree of involvement, they decided to do a pneumonectomy to treat it. So, can you show us the axial again because the pattern sure. of growth is a bit unusual. More of, most of it is growing eccentric to the lumen of that aorta. It's a bulk, it's a lot of tumor bulk. You mean the pulmonary artery? Yeah, the pulmonary artery, it, right? It, it's just it was just that like it looked like it was growing along the walls and oh, like yeah. internal, especially in the along the roof of the left pulmonary artery. And I think it's here just expanding in the vessel. Oh, I see, you know, like as you go up into the apical posterior portion, it's just completely replacing that vessel. And it looked like, you know, more deviating the airways out of the way. You know, I wasn't sure, but that's, that's what I thought, you know, that was what I led with and that's what it turned out to be, so. Yeah, interesting. All right, let's see which one. Oh, this is, you know, this is just, again, I haven't seen one this good in a while, but Howard's, you know, one of your your favorites here. This guy I you know, over the course of going to go. <laughs> yeah, so here he was on the ninth. Here he was a week later, yeah. and you know, we have curly A through whatever different lines here. Mm -hmm. you know, or, you know, but tons of you know interstitial edema, probably some alveolar edema too. You can see there's there's a lot of peribronchial cuffing, just vascular indistinctness, and then this was the CT, and yeah, it's just a beautiful example of the septal lakes or, sep or venous lakes or septal pearls or whatever, you know, you like to describe there. You can see yeah, how it looks like the little sausage thing within the septae. Yeah, and this was rapid development over the course of, of a week. And you can see he's got pleural effusions and other findings of, of volume overload as well. And then I saw it yesterday when, oops, no, nope, that's not yesterday, but he was getting hydrated for some sort of chemotherapy, but you can see by yesterday it's all resolved. So just another example of, you know, pulmonary edema with more of a nodular appearance, if you will, from the venous lakes. So the cause was volume overload? Yeah, he, over hydration, yep. All right. Dramatic. Okay, this one is one of the more dramatic cases I think I've ever seen. And this is a congenital case. And let's see, let me stop that. And I'll let you look at the radiographs. And you can see this is a this is a six or five-year-old or six-year-old that this is the acute presenting chest radiograph. This was the prior chest radiograph. And she presented with a few days of large volume hemoptysis. And yes, she's had tons and tons of coils, tons of surgeries, but I'm wondering if you guys spot the uh, the unusual air-filled structure on this one, because it's pretty dramatic when you see it on the CT. Hold on a second. Um, certainly, um, below the, the parahyla clip on the left side, there's Actually, let's see if it's if it's on. Oh, okay. Here we go. Yeah, <laughs> it's in the pericardium. This right here, right? Yeah. Um, yep. Tubular, man. Tubular. It. Is, well, just wait till you see this. Yes, it is tubular, and this patient had large volume of hemoptysis, and you will see why. 
it is tubular and it is synthetic tubular and it is filled with air and it shouldn't be. So to make a long story short, this patient had a hypoplastic left heart. They had multiple surgeries. And most recently they had had a few months ago, a, a basically creation of a bi, uh, uh, bi-directional glen with a conduit from the superior vena cava to the left pulmonary artery. And that is what you are seeing here that is now thrombosed along the medial aspect and is completely full of air along the remainder of it. So this is air in the, what should be the left pulmonary artery graft, you know, of, of Glenn, so SVC to left PA. So she developed a fistula and she had had recurrent left upper lobe pneumonias. And so she had, you know, presumably something got infected and is communicating with a bronchus in this left upper lobe. But that's only part of it. You can also see she has this large pseudoaneurysm arising from the aortic arch. And you can see there's a lot of phlegmon and, and infected stuff in here. She also has a little bit of, of thrombus in the left lower lobe. But yeah, this was a synthetic a graft of a glen that became, you know, developed a airway to pulmonary artery fistula and is now completely replaced with air. And unfortunately, it's kind of a sad story because she's, at this point, there's not really much they can do. And she's actually, uh, she's DNR at this point. But this was overnight, they scanned her again. And you can still see that she has air throughout this left gland. The thrombus has propagated into her superior vena cava a little. And she also has thrombus in her little hypoplastic left ventricle in the right ventricular apex. And interestingly here, she has new thrombus along the aorta and extending to her left coronary artery ostium here. And this pseudoaneurysm continues to enlarge and she's got more infection here. But mm. yeah, I was hoping Seth was here. I've never seen this before as a complication of a of congenital heart disease surgery with you know air just replacing the entire left pulmonary artery. And I guess the, but, I guess the infection precludes doing a transplant. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. So yeah, it's she's between a rock and a hard place at this point, obviously. Wow. And so in this this portion of the surgery, you know, not to go through all of it, but when you know she just has this little rudimentary aorta that is that has that fills the coronary arteries. And so this anastomosis to the rest of her arch is a Damus K stanzel. That's the that is this portion of the surgery when you have a rudimentary aorta. And so you retrograde, perfuse the coronaries like this. So, yeah, so rather crazy case. Um, yeah, this is one, this is um, a recent one too from the VA. And I guess one of the, I think sometimes we just reflexively recommend studies without actually thinking of what you're doing next. So this was picked up on a shoulder radiograph and they said there's this pleural or extra pleural thing and they recommended getting a chest radiograph, which I think at that point in time, if you think about it, how is that gonna actually change anything? It should have gone straight to chest CT, but you know, I got to read the follow-up radiograph and you see there's this ovoid thing. It has the incomplete border sign. There's no destruction of the adjacent ribs or expansion of them. And it's kind of low, low density in general. You can see on the lateral view, I think it's more lateral and peripheral. So you're seeing it a little bit on FOSS. And so Howard, we, you showed a nerve sheath tumor, you know, certainly that'd be in the differential. If it's low density, you think maybe a lipoma, there was no pleural effusion to think pseudo tumor, you know, maybe a solitary fibrous tumor, but you can see that this is clearly just a benign appearing lipoma. And I, this is one of those ones I'm wondering where it actually which compartment it actually arises from. Because I think that some of these are muscle fibers, probably of the innermost intercostal muscle that are stretched inward. Because you can see it looks like it's you know, extending outward. So I don't know if it's in, the, in some fat between the, you know, it, the, between the innermost intercostal and the internal intercostal muscle or not. I mean, it's certainly an academic point. I don't think this is you know, anything but a benign lipoma, but it's just a, it's an yeah. it's a interesting radiograph. It is. I think so, it's, it's on both sides of muscle fibers, and that's why it bulges in both directions. Yeah. So it's so the, the extra pleural fat would be 
internal to the innermost intercostal. So it's got to be deeper than that. Is that what you're? Right. Yeah. Yeah, that's what I'm thinking too. So along the intercostal vessels, perhaps, or something. But, you know, just a nice incidental finding there. Very nice. Uh, let's see. This one is one that I have never seen. I, I show this because this is one that has, I've never seen before and never heard of. So this is a patient who had an incidentally discovered little endobronchial thing. You can see it's hypervascular. It's in the right main stem bronchus slash proximal bronchus intermedius. And there are a few other studies in between here, but you know, it was in hindsight probably there. There's a little divot there in 2015. You know, certainly not as big, but there were several intervening studies. And so, you know, when I see this, I would think first and foremost about a carcinoid tumor, just given how hypervascular it is. But, you know, and a whole host of other things, and this happens to be one of those other random things. They did an endobronchial biopsy, or do you want to say something? Or How about a metastatic renal cancer? It's a good thought, yeah. This patient has no history of cancer. Certainly, they have probably smoked, given how bad their aorta is. It's been there. It's been pretty indolent for, for several years, and this was asymptomatic. And this actually turned out to be a perineuroma or perineurioma. I don't know if you guys have ever encountered that or heard of that before. Um, but, no. but basically, no, it's just no. a, it's a benign tumor of the perineural cells. So it's kind of a nerve sheath tumor, but it's a perineurioma. Wow. And there are limited case reports. I can only find one case report of an endobronchial one. And you know, that's kind of like how this is, just a small little nodule. They didn't have a contrast enhanced CT to show if it was vascular or not. But when the when the interventional bronchoscopist went in, it was submucosal. It was kind of stretching out the the membrane, but it wasn't, you know, it wasn't in the mucosa. So no, I you know. never heard of that. That is so interesting. So the, there was another the series I found you know, done nicely. Huh. Curious. Yeah. So the spindle yeah, cell. Not that I'm going to be. Yeah. Not that I'm going to be including this in a differential diagnosis no. <laughs> anytime soon. But it's you know it's a fun one to have in the teaching file. So. Great. Never heard of that. Yeah, them. and so perineural, perineural cells are along all nerves, and there was one case series I saw of like 80 cases where the report just you know, varying occurrences throughout the body and ranging in size from less than a centimeter to several centimeters. And I guess some of the stains when they're larger especially can help differentiate from malignant peripheral nerve sheath tumors. But in this case, this patient you know, is in late 60s, they're asymptomatic, they're probably just going to watch it. Very interesting. And then this is a fun one. Let's see, go to this. On a contrast enhanced CT, there's this thing that's you know, situated in the subcoronal space. I don't have a radiograph, unfortunately. You know, first glance, you think maybe it's enhancing a little, but you can notice that there's a subtle gradient yes. of the attenuation in this. Like milk of calcium. Yeah, well, yeah. I don't, this is on an abdomen and pelvis CT. This was the top shot from five years ago. And there you go, David. There's even, you know, a little bit more discrete milk of calcium right there. And so I don't know, you know, if this guy is doing jumping jacks or something to agitate it to where it just distributes out through this, you know, before he gets scanned. But here you can see on this non-con study that he had too, that it's just, yeah, very high attenuation, certainly, you know, consistent with a foregut duplication cyst. And they went in, they actually weren't able to resect the whole thing because it was adherent to a lot of the structures. They took out some of the, the walls. And I thought it was interesting that the pathologist couldn't even determine if it was foregut or bronchogenic, or you know, esophageal or bronchogenic cyst. Right. Oh, that's right. But yeah, pretty classic and, one right there. And then in the very yeah. I, I have seen calcium and bronchogenic cysts before, the milk of calcium phenomenon. <laughs> I think it, it's that mu mucus will calcify in the right setting. I don't know whether it requires inspissation or, you know, certain pHs or something like that, but. I've seen uh, calcification in the contents of a bronchogenesis before. Yeah. Um, 
here, Howard, if you don't mind, pause for one second. I'm going to pull up the other that other uh, infarcted sequestration that I have. Okay, so this is one. This is one I showed a while ago, and this was a patient that presented with left-sided chest pain, had this left effusion. This is left lower lobe, and then they had this non-enhancing lung associated, or at least partly associated, with the left lower lobe. And so this is one where you, you know, you look at the aorta, you don't really see anything. And this wasn't called prospectively, but maybe there's a tiny little stalk right there. But this actually turned out to be a hemorrhagic infarcted uh, extra lobar sequestration. Wow. And yeah, this was the this was the the history. Yeah, I showed this one a while ago. Yeah, there, so there was a stalk, you know, and they thought that this was let's see, maybe this is the pathology. Yeah, extra lobar sequestration, hemorrhagic infarction. So so I guess, you know, it can happen, but that's why I'm wondering about that other case, so. Interesting, yeah, very interesting. Keep us posted on that, on that first case. Oh, I definitely will. So hopefully, uh, hopefully they'll get tissue and I think it needs to be resected, but yeah. all right, that is, that's all I have for this week, Howard.